be fairly critical of you. He was not too happy when you accepted a knighthood, was he? No, I mean, he, he's not a happy person. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 bandmates who hate each other. He was making, you know, a lot of the decisions and doing basically whatever he wanted to do. So I don't know how you can not feel a part of something that you're almost completely controlling. For this list, we'll be looking at bandmates, both past and present, who have famously never gotten along. It doesn't matter if these people have reconciled in recent years. As long as they once hated each other, they're fair game. Did you know about these skirmishes? Let us know in the comments. Hey Mojoholics! For a chance to win cash prizes, play our live daily trivia challenges every day at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern only at watchmojo.com slash play. Number 20. Eddie Van Halen and everyone except Alex. Van Halen. Maybe there's a reason the band is called Van Halen. It's almost like Ed doesn't want anyone else there. The guitarist and David Lee Roth have decades of animosity between them, mostly stemming from Roth's outgoing, childlike personality rubbing EVH the wrong way. Which may have been exacerbated by Ed's substance use disorder. But Ed has also spoken ill of former bassist Michael Anthony, claiming Anthony was a quote, garbage bass player. Then there's Roth's most famous replacement, Sammy Hagar, who left in the late 90s over managerial and creative differences. Rock and roll is tough, and the personalities within often tougher. We cried and we hugged and he split, and two weeks later I'm reading in Rolling Stone what an asshole I am. Number 19, The Monkees. Despite successful and distinct songs like I'm a Believer and Daydream Believer, the Monkees are usually held as an American Beatles copycat. Then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. They did virtually everything that the Fab Four did, but not quite as effectively, including a failed movie called Head. Heck, they even broke up in the same year. Like the late 60s Beatles, the Monkees did not get along. Tension was rife throughout their four years of activity, and the members weren't particularly interested in acting as a band. In fact, Peter Tork was so desperate to escape that he paid out his contract to leave early, equating to roughly $5 million today. And just like pulling a thread, the monkeys unraveled from there. Number 18, Caleb and Jared Folliwell, Kings of Leon. I can get there on my own. Getting along with family can be difficult. Just imagine if you had to work and tour with them every day. Caleb and Jared Folliwell, along with their brother Nathan and cousin Matthew, make up Kings of Leon, the band behind songs like Sex on Fire and Use Somebody. You know that I can use somebody. And, like most brothers in music, Caleb and Jared don't exactly get along. Or at least they didn't. It mostly stemmed from Caleb's alcohol use disorder, as Jared despised Caleb's nonchalance and unprofessional behavior. Caleb in turn hated Jared for tarnishing his name and not believing in him. Luckily, Caleb eventually quit drinking and the brothers reconciled. Number 17, Black Francis vs. Kim Deal, Pixies. The Pixies weren't so much a band as a backing group to frontman Black Francis. Francis was the main creative force behind the group, and it was he who wrote virtually all of their songs. Unfortunately, this caused friction between Francis and bassist Kim Deal. Deal wished for more creative freedom in the band, but Francis continually rejected her ideas, resulting in quite a lot of tension. This was compounded by the band's relentless touring schedule, which caused the members to grow exhausted and bitter. Francis threw a guitar at Deal during one concert, and at another, Deal completely refused to play. Francis eventually snapped and dissolved the Pixies in 1993. <laughs> Number 16, Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield versus Jason Newstead, Metallica. I can't remember anything. Can't tell if this is true or dream. 
despite Newstead serving as Metallica's bassist for almost 15 years, he was always the odd man out. This largely stems from him not being Cliff Burton, the band's original bass player, who was killed in a bus accident while the band were touring Sweden in 1986. Every day for us, something new. The band welcomed Newstead by burying his bass tracks on And Justice For All. Newstead chalked this up to Lars and James hazing him, but they would later blame this on his playing. Although seemingly there for the long haul, Newstead never quite felt respected and exited the band after a disagreement with Hetfield about a side project. I knew that that was my last performance with Metallica. Number 15, Eagles. All I want to see is five guys uh, happy playing together. When it comes to the best-selling albums in American history, the Eagles hold two of the top three spots. Hotel California is in third with 26 million sales, and their greatest hits 1971 to 1975 is in first with 38 million. Nestled between them is Michael Jackson's Thriller. It just goes to show that success doesn't necessarily equate to happiness. The Eagles did not get along, and Randy Meisner left the group following a physical fight with Glenn Frey. Everything came to a head on July 31st, 1980, known as the Long Night at Wrong Beach. But Randy didn't want to do the song that night. He'd been up partying all night with a couple of girls and a bottle of vodka. Frey and Don Felder openly bickered on stage, with each threatening to kick the others you-know-what. It was the end of the Eagles until 1994, with Frey saying, quote, We just took a 14-year vacation. Number 14, Steven Tyler vs. Joe Perry, Aerosmith. Steven Tyler and Joe Perry have long been songwriting partners. Hi, this is Steven Tyler. And I'm Joe Perry. We'll talk. Shut up after that, God damn it! And as is common with romantic partners who have also been together for a long time, it seems to be nothing but bickering between the two. Heavy substance use plagued the early years of Aerosmith, and it impacted the work of both Tyler and Perry. They would often record separately, and their animosity boiled over in 1979 when Perry left the group while recording Night in the Ruts. Perry and Tyler wouldn't reunite for almost another decade, when they both found success recording Walk This Way with Run DMC. However, the fighting continued into the 2010s, with physical onstage antics and Tyler signing to American Idol causing noticeable friction between the pair. Number 13, Steve Perry versus Everyone Else, Journey. Steve Perry was the new kid on the block, and not everybody liked him. All night, all night, oh, every night. Perry didn't make his first appearance with Journey until October 1977, when the band had already released three albums. Furthermore, he brought a mainstream pop sound to the progressive rock band that hardcore fans didn't exactly gel with. As a result, Perry was a bit of an odd man out. While his tenure brought great success to the band, he apparently never felt included, and he told VH1 as much during an episode of Behind the Music. Go out and do whatever you want to with whomever you want to and call it whatever you want to, but leave Journey alone." Personal problems and creative differences often brought him into conflict with the others, and he pretty much disappeared from the public spotlight after quitting the band in the late 80s. I really always felt that I was the, uh, an out, the outside guy. I just don't know how to, how to relate to that. I have no idea why he would feel that way. Number 12, Tom DeLonge versus Everyone Else, Blink-182. There are a few bands synonymous with pop punk, and Blink-182 is certainly one of them. Unfortunately, the band's success has negatively affected frontman Tom DeLonge. Where are you? And I'm so sorry. His time with Blink-182 initially came to an end in the mid-2000s, as he was growing increasingly disillusioned with touring and the time spent away from his family. DeLong later returned to the band, but the infighting continued, with a major source of contention being his musical side project, Angels and Airwaves. Like 
Unfortunately, this reunion did not last long, as DeLong left the band again in 2015 following personal and creative conflicts. Though there was more turbulence following this, the trio put aside their differences in 2023 for a reunion tour that was enormously successful. Number 11. Mike Love and Brian Wilson, The Beach Boys Cousins Mike Love and Brian Wilson pioneered surf rock, and they revolutionized musical production with their 1966 album, Pet Sounds. But Beach Boys Mike and Brian rarely saw eye to eye. Mike has even called himself Brian's Antichrist due to their constant clashing, which included heated arguments over the band's experimental direction in the 60s. He also took Brian to court on numerous occasions for defamation and writing credits. And despite the two reuniting for a 50th anniversary tour, Love, who owns the Beach Boys brand, disbanded the anniversary lineup when the tour ended and resumed performing with a pack of hired guns. Number 10. Mick Jagger vs. Keith Richards – The Rolling Stones it's a miracle that we got the legendary music of the Rolling Stones at all, because songwriting partners Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were constantly at each other's throats. Their relationship has long been described as familial, and like most families, there is often some squabbling involved. But he's, so he's uh, often critical of you then? He's not happy. Their working partnership was at an all-time low in the mid-80s, following the middling success of Dirty Work and Jagger's unwillingness to promote it. That you can't always get what you want, honey. Compounding this was Jagger's increased focus on his solo career and growing disinterest with the Stones. Richards has claimed that he would, quote, shout and scream at Jagger, and he later called him, quote, unbearable in his autobiography. Number 9. Ray and Dave Davies – The Kinks Some brothers just find it hard to get along. Ray and Dave Davies worked together in The Kinks, with Ray on vocals and rhythm guitar and Dave on lead guitar. Dave once told The Telegraph, quote, I think Ray has only been happy for three years of his life. Those were the three before I was born. That pretty much sums it up. There's not one thing that caused their schism. It just seems they've never exactly gotten along, even in childhood. The Frosty relationship remained cold throughout their musical career, with arguments running rampant. And uh, I do a similar thing with my cymbal, and I caught him an unfortunate blow on the side of the head. You know. well, cer certainly upsetting. 18 stitches sounds a bit more than a joke. <laughs> Yes, 16. The band finally dissolved in 1996, and while rumors of a reunion have circled for decades, drummer Mick Avery laid them to rest in 2023, saying the brothers couldn't work it out. Said, Come down, son. My sister always did. Number 8. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley vs. Ace Freely and Peter Chris – Kiss you show us everything you got. Here we see a band split right down the middle. Kiss was one of the biggest and most controversial rock bands of the 70s, known for their electrifying music and elaborate stage shows. And while they continue to play to this day, they do so without Ace Frehley and Peter Criss. Chris was dismissed in 1980, and Freely left soon after over disagreements with the band's direction and for constantly being ignored in band decisions. Although the band held a reunion in 1995, both Ace and Peter have re-exited and remain on poor terms with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, who, among themselves, don't seem to be on great terms anymore. Any idiot can get a, a woman when they're on tour, but this is a lot more important. Number 7. Joey and Johnny Ramone – Ramones There is one main name in punk rock, and that's the Ramones. Hey, oh, let's go! Hey, oh, let's go! Hey, oh, 
Let's go! In a fun little bit, each member adopted a pseudonym with the surname Ramon, so Joey and Johnny aren't actually brothers. But that didn't stop them from fighting like it. Well, well you know, FCC, you, guys are like the, you guys are like the Phil Donahue of punk. You started it, <laughs> right? And then, like, all of a sudden, everyone else is doing it. The two were reportedly constantly bickering about any and every little thing, including politics and the direction of the band's career. Everything took a turn for the worse, though, when Joey's girlfriend, Linda Danielle, left him for Johnny. While they continued to tour, this incident permanently soured Joey and Johnny's relationship, and there was simply no going back. The two never reconciled, and Joey died from cancer in 2001 without, it's been said, so much as a phone call from Johnny. There's nowhere else to go. We're just, uh... No, you sound a little pissed off. Number 6. The Entire Band – Fleetwood Mac when do we get the Fleetwood Mac movie? Because boy, is that story juicy. Despite producing one of the greatest albums ever in rumors, Fleetwood Mac was a mess from the very beginning. In fact, six people had already come and gone before Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks joined the band. By the way, guess who you get to go on stage with tomorrow night? The person that either broke up with you or you broke up with. And you have to go on stage and just be like, fantastic. The making of Rumors was also famously turbulent, as the entire band was fighting with each other and refusing to speak outside of the studio. Despite this, the iconic lineup stayed together for another decade before splitting after 1987's Tango in the Night. Buckingham quit the band following a physical altercation with Nick's, and Nick's followed soon after in the midst of an argument with Mick Fleetwood. You know, we were still young enough then that destiny could have taken us another way. Number 5. Billy Corgan and Darcy Retsky, Billy Corgan and James Eha, The Smashing Pumpkins. The Smashing Pumpkins were huge, but man, were they hostile. James Eha and Darcy Retsky briefly dated, but managed to keep things cordial post-breakup. Relations between Darcy and Billy Corgan were never quite as smooth. Although credited on albums up until Machina 2, Retsky held resentment after Corgan took over her bass duties on Siamese Dream. And Corgan has been less than kind towards her since the 90s came to a close. Though Eha rejoined the Pumpkins in 2018, he, like Darcy, did not take part in their initial reunion in the late 2000s, and had been insulted by Corgan on a number of occasions. Number 4. Simon and Garfunkel Simon and Garfunkel are one of the best-known duos in music history, and believe it or not, they hated each other's guts nearly every step of the way. What's that you say, Mrs. Robinson? The recording of Bridge Over Troubled Water was rife with difficulties for the duo, and they called it quits after its release. They later refused to talk to each other, and despite brief reunions, continue their resentment and constant verbal jabs. Uh, we've known each other since we are 11. Yeah, and, that's hard uh, sometimes. We've been, um, we've been having arguments since, since we are 12. <laughs> when Simon was asked about a reunion in 2016, he quickly shut it down, telling the reporter that he and Garfunkel don't get along and that touring with him is not enjoyable. And whispered in the sun. Of Number 3. Roger Waters vs. David Gilmour, Nick Mason, and Richard Wright, Pink Floyd breathe, breathe in the air. Already industry vets, Pink Floyd's commercial peak came with 1973's The Dark Side of the Moon, lasting until The Wall, but that sudden and massive success also ratcheted up the tension between bassist and principal songwriter Roger Waters and the rest of the band. Waters' exclusive role as lyricist netted him half the royalties to any of their non-instrumental songs. While he typically wrote or co-wrote the majority of the music during this era as well, entitling him to an additional cut. My hands felt just like two 
issues between Waters and Wright led to Wright's dismissal, while Waters' animosity with Gilmore and dissatisfaction with Mason ultimately led to Waters himself leaving. Number 2. Axl Rose and Slash – Guns N' Roses Guns N' Roses were exactly what the late 80s needed, but while Axl and Slash couldn't have done it without each other, they really could have done without each other. Tensions between the two finally hit a breaking point in 1996 when Slash took his top hat and went home, following in the footsteps of Izzy Stradlin and Steven Adler. At the time, he stated that it was due to personal and creative differences with Rose, but would later cite Rose's hostile attitude and unprofessional behavior, Rose's increasing legal control of the band, and the earlier departures of his missed bandmates as a motivator. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Liam and Noel Gallagher – Oasis Slip inside the eye of your mind. Ooh boy, where do we even start with the Gallaghers? Well, it's really more like Liam hating Noel with every fiber of his being. Liam has reportedly expressed his wish to beat his brother with a guitar, and constantly refers to him as a potato over social media. Liam apparently got his wish in 2009, as the brothers came to physical blows at a festival, and Liam swung a guitar at Noel's head. You know, he nearly took my face off with it, you know. So I was like, you know what? Out of it. Noel has in turn stated that Liam is frightened to death of him, and that he, quote, plays him like a slightly disused arcade game. Ah, uh, nothing like the timeless bonds of brotherly love. I said, maybe you're gonna be the one that saves me. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.